Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Express, Sharing Scotland's Stories, organised by CAM Scotland. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few things so you know how the event will work and how to participate in the Q&A session. The presentation will last for approximately 30 to 35 minutes, followed by a short 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. You'll be able to post any questions you have by typing into the question chat box in the control panel, which you'll see on the right hand side of your screen if watching on a laptop or along the bottom if you're watching on a tablet or smartphone. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. If you look in the handout section, you'll find a copy of the presentation slides, which you can download along with a list of additional reading resources to complement today's presentation. If you want to share your thoughts on social media, we're using the hashtag CIM events. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch on demand in a few days time on the CIM Scotland webpage and the CIM YouTube channel. And finally, you'll be emailed a short feedback survey after the event, which we'd love you to complete. It'll only take a few minutes and all survey responses are anonymous. So please do let us know your thoughts. So I'd now like to hand you over to Kat Lever, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, Kat. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for having me along today. And so as Judith mentioned, my name's Kat Lever. I'm the head of brand at Visit Scotland. And I'm here to talk today about Brand Scotland to how we built and continue to build a profile for Scotland internationally in what is a fiercely competitive global marketplace. Whether we like it or not, with a population of just five and a half million people, Scotland is a relatively small country in a very large and noisy marketplace. And so the question really was, how can we get ourselves noticed? And that starts with ambition. We needed to aim high to know that we were worthy of such status. And that requires a level of confidence, of consistency, and of conviction. So let's take a step back for a second. Why is competing for international profile important in the first place? Because in a world that's increasingly connected and internationalized, we are absolutely at the mercy of our reputation to compete for talent, for international students and researchers, for tourists, and for trade and investors, all of whom are vital to a thriving and sustainable economy particularly one like Scotland's, where our working age population is on the decline, and therefore we absolutely need and rely upon migration in order to fill this talent gap and grow the economy. Never mind all the other amazing benefits of migration, like diversity of thought, cultural perspective, and a richer and more vibrant society. When we set out on this journey, what our research was telling us was that awareness of Scotland around the world was relatively low in comparison to other nations of a similar size and or offering. Positively, when people did know us, they looked upon Scotland very fondly, often recognising us for some of the best traits like the warmth of our people and the quality of our experiences. But their understanding of our offering was somewhat one-dimensional and limited. With things like landscapes, tartan, whiskey and bagpipes often very well recognised, but other crucially important elements like our world-class education system and plethora of top universities, our record levels of research or our long-standing history of innovation are less well known. And it's these factors that influence decisions to live, work or to do business in or with a country. And so we had some pretty major hurdles to overcome. How do we retain and reinforce those positive attributes for which we are known whilst increasing general awareness for Scotland and enriching that reputation for these other qualities which we have in spades but are not necessarily recognised for. The first piece of the puzzle was collaboration. For decades our national organisations have worked really hard delivering fantastic results in their individual areas all of which have very wide economic scope but this was often in silos and so in 2016 planning started initially with the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise or Economic Agency and Visit Scotland, a national tourism organisation, seeking to directly face into these challenges. By 2018, these partners had brought on board others like University of Scotland, but they had committed significant proportions of their international marketing spend and their own resource to create what is Brand Scotland and a new national marketing strategy, Scotland is now. And this is where I was brought in. Uh, to drive this new pan-agency initiative forward and to develop a strategy to allow it to evolve and grow into a sustainable operating model. Our aim to make Scotland a country of first choice in which to live, to work, to study, to do business and to visit. 
We wanted to tell Scotland's stories, allowing them to evidence and shape perceptions around the world. Once we had all the players aligned, the first step was to establish a shared vision. Nation place brand and marketing is, is really complex. It requires a long term strategic view. We cannot influence and shape perceptions of a place overnight. And so this vision has to be over 5, 10, 20 years or more. It has to be based on thorough research and insights and implemented with agility, consistency and rigour. Place branding is all about who you are and what you stand for. In essence, it's your value proposition. But unlike in commercial or product branding, you do not create this proposition. It has to be authentic and based on who we are as a nation and how we are perceived. Whilst simultaneously, it also has to be aspirational. It has to be something that our citizens and our advocates buy into and want to promote and advocate for. And so we spent a lot of time analysing existing data, conducting new research, and establishing what our core value proposition was for Scotland, identifying us as welcoming, determined, creative, pioneering, and generous of spirits. Place marketing is then all about how we communicate. We needed to build a coherent and enduring narrative that was pivotal um, to everything else that we did. And so we established the national marketing strategy Scotland is now based on that values proposition which provides a platform through which partners could communicate consistently with the world about Scotland. Step two was about maximising this collaboration, bringing together our shared expertise and talent to work across what we call pillars, which are live, work, visit, study and business. And these are the, the economic pillars around which we operate. We needed to build a consistent and unified voice for Scotland with aligned deliverables and activity. Our Central Grand Scotland team drew in expertise from across our national partners, creating a pan-agency team and ensuring that we had a comprehensive and complete picture, which then allowed us to collaborate at a deeper level than ever seen before. In essence, it was all about achieving a consistent identity for Scotland. We should largely look and sound the same no matter which national partner our audiences are engaging with. We needed to make every transaction they had with us as simple as possible and for each of those transactions to reinforce our positioning and our profile, ensuring that the identity we build of Scotland is authentic and endures. Step three was about changing that narrative. So we knew what we were known for, but there were so many other great stories that allowed us to highlight those values for which we hadn't told or we were not known yet. So we established our Scotland is now creative look and feel our digital infrastructure and a toolkit for partners to access and leverage the assets that we create. In essence, what we were aiming to do was open source quality marketing collateral for Scotland that allowed us then to be consistent in our delivery. This new narrative aimed to ensure we established a single tone based on our value set, a shared look and feel for our marketing activity and collateral across partners, and a central set of digital platforms that act like gateways into Scotland and signpost off to that broader partner ecosystem, ensuring that every online visitor can quickly get to where they need to go and allowing us to tell those stories in a consistent way and in a way that allows us to spread them far and wide. On the 11th of April 2018, we launched Scotland Is Now simultaneously into the US, China and London with a bold brand film, outdoor media, digital and cinema coverage and a series of major events like the FM's launch in China. Step four, which is a bit of a golden ticket, is about driving advocacy. With considerably more conservative budgets than other nation brand teams and units around the world, we have to maximise on the voices and networks of others to get our stories out there. But to do that requires having something that they buy into. So based on all our research and insight, we designed a series of films which spoke to our various audience groups from the same audience groups. So allowing the people of Scotland to tell their stories in a way that felt authentic and credible and critically in a way that was shareable online. We could then use this data to target a forensic level layering targeting data ensuring the most efficient use of our marketing budgets. And these stories built upon our values proposition along with our brand film becoming the core of our advocacy drive passing out through a range of ambassadors and networks to audiences around the globe. A key guiding principle for everything we do, as aforementioned, is, is rigour. We seek to base everything we do on insight and data, um, as any good marketer would, which means we have to look at how we measure success, and that allows us to assess a performance 
and ensure that we're always optimizing our activities towards our long-term objective. It's really important to stress that nation place marketing is all about that long-term ambition. We need to prioritize activity and map out KPIs across the short, medium and long-term. And so that's what we've done here over a 10 year period, thinking about what the mix of softer metrics around awareness, perception and collaboration are, as well as those harder metrics around engagement, propensity and economic impact. We maximised on a digital first video led strategy for the launch of Scotland is Now, in recognition that with global audiences that we were trying to reach and a massive ambition, we needed to make our conservative budgets work really, really hard for us. So a digital first strategy allowed us to focus on quality networks and distribution channels, that forensic level of targeting and real time results around which we could learn and adapt and deliver. And it paid off. On the day of launch, we exceeded all of our targets set. We reached one sixth of the rest of the UK's population with our YouTube ad and achieved a position within the top 10% of YouTube performance ads globally within April of that year alongside major brands with far more superior marketing budgets like Apple and BMW. What's more, we were able to deliver record levels of positive sentiment, so 28 times more positive sentiment than negative, and our engagement rates blew benchmark figures from competitors out the water. And this created a very positive trajectory upon which our ongoing activity could be built, allowing us to continue to, to build upon those strengths over the next six months. We grew our online audiences with a 15% uplift in web visitors, starting from a point of nil, particularly with high levels of visitor growth in our key target markets of London, USA and China. We managed to deliver greater engagement with an 85% growth in social channel followership, over a thousand daily uses of our Scotland is now hashtag, and consistently delivered over 90% positive sentiment. But beyond this, what we found surprising and very positive was we also saw far greater impact at levels that we hadn't anticipated would happen until maybe the medium term so after six months uh, we saw referrals to our partner websites growing significantly and a direct economic impact in this across linked pillar activity so for example in the area of the visit pillar in those first six months our activity and channels were directly attributable to 382,000 pounds worth of hotel bookings and that's only the ones that were direct and tracked. But as I've mentioned repeatedly, because it's important, <laughs> this requires a consistent and long-term vision. So this is an, an at-a-glance overview of what was delivered in the two and a bit years I've headed up Brown Scotland. At the heart of everything, and not visible on this slide, is our organic activity and the work that we do across our owned and earned channels. The power of this should never be underestimated in marketing. I think we all like to talk about the kind of flashy campaigns and big media buys because that's the sexy stuff but ensuring we maintain our own and earned channels build relevant digital platforms and blossoming vibrant online communities that's absolutely at the heart of our success what this slide does show is that on top of all of that undercurrent of activity this is our campaign activity and our hero branded events that we ran and as you can see these were all about addressing tactical needs like filling talent gaps for example or leveraging key moments in time where Scotland had something unique or pertinent to share with the world. And that was about building upon that core values proposition, strengthening our positioning and ultimately Scotland's identity. In the medium term, which we categorise as that six to 24 month period, Brand Scotland was focused on our awareness and reputation metrics. And this is something that we continue to measure and we will do for the longer term. Brand Scotland uses um, Scotland's biennial and HALT GFK MBI report to measure top line success around awareness and reputation and this is the same approach used by several other leading brand units around the world including the likes of New Zealand and Iceland. Scotland's overall ranking against 50 other countries is listed as well as six specific categories and attributes. But the key indicator for us is this overall NBI score because it talks about our performance year on year not in relation to other countries performance unlike the way that the rank does so it's, it's more comparable and just this morning we got the latest results through so scotland's 2020 score is has come out at 62.6 which is relatively maintaining our levels um, from the previous two years meaning scotland remains in the top 20 countries worldwide and indicates that we have a high level of international recognition We've remained relatively stable over these past two years, and I think that's very positive given the challenges we've faced around things like Brexit and the pandemic. 
We've also built a very strong profile for Scotland as a nation brand. So in April 2020, City Nation placed an analytic source around a survey with nation brand experts, consultants, agencies and academics from around the world. And they ranked Scotland in the top five most admired global praised brands in the world. So that's alongside very esteemed company like New Zealand, London, Amsterdam and New York. And for me, I think that's a marked success. There's a huge accolade to have achieved in just two years to have gone from you know, not really having a nation brand to being one of the most admired in the world. So it's something we're hugely proud of. I'm not going to dwell on these stats too long because I've talked a lot about results, but I didn't want to miss out this broader midterm results overview because it's important, as I said, to think about how it all feeds them together. You'll see that we've continued to grow reach and engagement across our brand channels, but critically, we've also started to move the dial on other KPIs like advocacy and collaborative outputs. Having painted that longer term strategic vision, uh, I'm now going to talk about the sexy stuff. So I'm going to talk you through just one piece of our campaign activity as an example of how we focus um, on bringing our value proposition to life through storytelling. So by 2019, the biggest challenge facing Scotland was Brexit over the heady days pre-pandemic. 2016 research by the University of Strathclyde concluded that under all modelled scenarios, Brexit was predicted to have a negative impact on Scotland's economy. And so by mid-February 2019, Brexit uncertainty sorry, had become an intolerable risk to Scottish businesses and communities. Prime Minister May's deal had twice been rejected by Parliament, Article 50 countdown was running out rapidly, and the UK was scheduled to leave the EU on March 29th, with or without a deal. We were seeing this translate into significant drops in both industry business and consumer confidence within the UK and within our EU markets, and it was impacting every single one of our economic pillars as a result of that. And so it was incumbent upon us to act. The challenge was, this wasn't something with any real certainty. Deadlines kept moving, no one was really knew what was going to happen or what the predicted outcome would be. And so consequently, this wasn't something that had been budgeted for. We recognised that there was a unique window in time here. We could use the original Brexit day of March 29th to send a bold message of commitment from Scotland to Europe. It wasn't about the politics. It was about our European neighbours and natives living here in Scotland, knowing that no matter what the outcome of Brexit, we remained committed to our enduring relationship with them. The ambition was clear, to reach out to people in Europe who might be put off from living, working, studying, visiting or doing business with us, and send the message that Scotland remains an open, welcoming, inclusive nation. With under 30 working days to seize the opportunity, the campaign was built on three strategic choices, to go fast, to go big and to go bold. So going fast, to maximise impact, we took the audacious decision to launch on March 29th, despite our 30 day window, the day the UK was scheduled to leave the EU and with the spotlight of the world on the UK. We couldn't wait for certainty on what the Brexit scenario would be on launch day, so we designed a creative idea that would work in any one of the six model scenarios, so ranging from agreed deal to snap general election to crashing out. With no time for formal creative testing, we called upon our network of offices across Europe for fast turnaround guidance on things like cultural and language issues. The go big was about the initial planning. So the initial planning, we'd identified seven priority European markets based on their socioeconomic relationship with Scotland. But we quickly took the decision to focus on just four, France, Germany, Spain and Ireland. By going big in four countries, we took an educated risk that the resulting PR and social media impact would reach other countries, even if our paid media didn't. Brand Scotland audiences are very diverse and complex, spanning tourists, businesses, students, and people open to living and working in other countries. Instead of strategy, instead of um, focusing our strategy sorry, on a hyper-targeting and nuance, we decided to ladder up to the biggest, broadest message that would re resonate with all of our audience groups. And our objectives were equally as big. We wanted to reach at least 10% of the population in our target geographies by mid-April and achieve 30% agreement that Scotland is an open and welcoming nation. Going bold to maximise impact, we took the decision to invest the bulk of the budget into five massive days of paid media. We backed a fame and inspiration media strategy using premium formats to maximise reach and impact and make the biggest possible statement from YouTube homepage takeovers to double page spreads in newspapers. We took a calculated risk on investing in digital video rather than TV advertising, sacrificing that TV stature for the bigger opportunity of provoking a visible public response on social media. This was all in an outrageously ambitious endeavour. It required multiple organisations to create a massive pan-European campaign 
from scratch in under 30 working days with absolutely no way of predicting what the Brexit scenario would be on launch day. And this required extraordinary levels of collaboration from Brown Scotland partners and their agencies amid unparalleled political uncertainty. The proposition was simple. Scotland values its relationship with Europe no matter what happens and this will not change. But the delivery was complex. It had to transcend cultural and geographic boundaries. It had to shine a spotlight at a time that was very, very noisy. So instead of asking what will work in these markets, we asked ourselves, if you or I were to speak to our European neighbours, what would we want to say? What would we want them to hear at this point of time? What really matters? And so our creative idea was born. We wanted to send a message directly to Europe with a cheeky tagline, Hey Europe, let's continue our love affair. On Friday the 29th of March 2019, the UK government held a final vote on Theresa May's Brexit deal and the Brown Scotland team held its breath knowing our campaign was about to break. This slide shows the campaign in a nutshell. We combined, as I said, digital display, YouTube takeovers, paid and organic social media, news display ads with double page spreads in key international publications and some out of home and some major airports. And that was all about delivering a large scale integrated media campaign aiming to maximize reach and frequencies with those key audiences. We also leveraged the power and reach of our brand Scotland partners and their channels. So building on that collaborative piece and focusing on our own earned activity, we were able to generate widespread PR coverage both at home and abroad. And the results speak for themselves. This was the most successful campaign ever run by the public sector. We exceeded every single smart objective set by at least twofold. In just five days, we reached over 78 million people with the paid media alone. And that's 39% of the entire population of our key target markets against an original ambition of 10%. We also delivered 25 million completed video views in that period. But it wasn't people just seeing the campaign. They were also acting upon it. We saw huge spikes in web traffic and social channel followership and engagement and sharing. And what made this campaign truly unique and special was the way that the world reacted. Beyond the video views, Scotland is Open campaign inspired almost 9 million engagements and over 90% of the social commentary was positive. For any marketer, it's this response that you, that you live for hearing from your audiences and, and making sure that that message resonates. And within minutes of the campaign launching, we were awash with emotional, heartfelt responses from Europe. Our plan to go big in just four key markets worked. It created a ripple effect, not just across Europe, but also far further across the globe. We had engagement from people as far afield as Canada and Australia, reasserting the purposes of this activity, which wasn't just about our relationship with Europe, but about the underlying commitment from Scotland to be a good global citizen, recognising the value in our relationships with other nations and nationals from around the world. And beyond that, Scotland got behind the campaign, living those values and showing the world that we really were an open, welcoming, inclusive nation. This was more than just a campaign. It was a strategic and tactical activation of a key positioning statement that feeds into our overall long-term strategy. You'd anticipate good results from a campaign of this scale, but what we created and delivered was extraordinary levels of engagement. This campaign far exceeded not only the targets that we had set for it, but all industry benchmarks around engagement and performance. And in terms of the social response, it's what you can tr call truly viral marketing. And linking back to that longer term vision, it fed into a continued strong performance across our KPIs showing that our strategy was working. People were seeing and engaging and doing more than ever before. We'd reached in this time, so by September 2019, over 221 million people on the paid media alone, never mind the organic side. We'd, have, we'd had over 181 million views of our videos. Our web visitors and our social channels continued to grow and advocacy shown through things like our, our hashtag continued to grow now up to over 2,000 uses every single day. And we're only just getting started. That was already two years ago now. And since then, we've ran Scotland is Open again in response to the new Brexit date of 31st of January 2020. And that achieved even more overwhelming results. It built on something that we had established across partners, across audiences, and delivered high performance, particularly organically, where we saw one single organic Facebook post generate 2.64 million in terms of reach 
and just under a million video views. And that's pretty unheard of for an organic Facebook post. But what it really does is show how Scotland is now and the power of collaboration and storytelling deliver as a marketing tool. It evidences why having a clear purpose and values proposition that underpins everything that you do will help you to retain authenticity and allow you to resonate with your audiences. In divided times, the collaborative spirit of Brand Scotland shows that what can be achieved when we dare to align behind a common goal and be brave together. I'm going to end it there because it's an awful lot to get through and hand over to Judith so that we can have some Q&A. But thank you so much for listening to my presentation today. That's great. Many thanks for your insights there, Kat. So we're now going to have a short 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. You can still submit questions for Kat in the questions box. And if you're enjoying today's webinar and want to post on social media, you can do use the hashtag CIM events. So our first question today is, how can Scottish local authorities partner with Scotland, the brand, to work to showcase their own region's value? So we do a lot of work across um, various GMOs, local authorities, etc. There's a number of things they can do. So using the toolkit and the assets, um, they're there very much to help you promote both at Scotland wide and a more specific region. In terms of shining a spotlight on specific regions, we then also ask people to, to come forward and contact us so that we can look at what's the what's the unique proposition there. And is there something that we can either develop or are there areas that we're already working on so we're not duplicating effort to either amplify it through our channels or build it into our longer term strategy. Um, so as I said, the kind of Brand Scotland's key focus is on that Scotland wide cross pillar proposition. But absolutely underneath that, there's a lot of strengths that sit at an individual regional level that they were seeking to build up. And we did some great work with the likes of Dundee, for example when the V&A opened um, as an opportunity again to capitalise on all eyes looking at Scotland, a lot of media attention and how we could present um, both Dundee's past but also its, its future in terms of its strengths. So I would say get in touch, use the assets we have, get in touch, let us know what you're working on and uh, we can look to where those alignment opportunities. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, was it difficult to get partners on board and bought into this um, when it hadn't been done before and how did you approach that? Uh, yes and no. So, so it's, I think it's always difficult when you're talking about multiple stakeholders. I was very lucky in that the kind of embryo of Brand Scotland was in place before I was brought in, I was brought in to kind of take it forward. Um, so a lot of that partner alignment um, had already happened and I think we were very lucky because we had the right people in the right positions at that time um, so in the kind of senior marketing and CEO type positions across our partners who really understood the value and the importance of this. Longer term there's a there's a need to continue to maintain that so I think if anybody who's worked in any capacity across multiple stakeholders or collaborative uh, initiatives it's it's fine getting them on page at the beginning but you need to keep them there so there's an awful lot of work around communication and stakeholder management um, visibility reporting just making sure that they understand what you're doing why you're doing it and how they're feeding into it it was quite unique as i said in terms of the setup because we had that contribution at the beginning in terms of both all of our budget was made up from the partners and all of our resource initially was made up from the partners so that allowed us to get a balance that's sort of an equity in terms of what people were putting in, even if it wasn't equal in terms of value. Um, but it allowed us to get that equity and view and a holistic picture of what was going on. But yeah, I think the key things for, for managing that is ongoing communication and managing expectations. So for us, people understanding that this is a long-term vision, that you can't change perceptions overnight. And we're very much working towards, you know, the 10 or 20 years to see the major impact that we want to see. Okay, um, practical question, probably quite a quick one to answer. What proportion of the budget was spent on research from the campaign budget? So it depends uh, on different stages. In the first year, did you do? so before we launched, it, all of our budget was on research um, and then it was on sort of the delivery of, you know, setting up new digital channels, etc. Once we've launched, it probably breaks down to about 20% of our spend goes on research and insights. It's quite significant. 
Um, but it's really, really important for us. And actually, what we're trying to do is move towards models that increase the efficiency of that. So the long term view is hopefully we can do kind of mass benchmarking exercises for Scotland across things like our perception studies um, so that there is one Scotland wide base of, of insight that any partner could then draw down on. And, and within reason, that would be also public information. So that allows everybody to benefit from, from this information rather than individual organisations having to go off and conduct their own. Um, but yeah, 20% is probably uh, an accurate figure. Okay, um, the next quite, quite a topical one. Does Brand Scotland have a narrative around COP26 and the opportunity that creates for Glasgow and Scotland? Maybe explain what COP26 is for people who may not know. <laughs> so COP is the um, where all the nations come together to talk about climate change. Um, so we had the Paris Agreement came out of COP, for example. The next big COP, which is 26, is in November. It was supposed to be November of last year, but for obvious reasons was not. And is due to be November of this year in Glasgow. And it's an incredible opportunity because, well, bringing, bringing together kind of thought leaders, decision makers, politicians, etc., from around the world to talk about climate. Um, but particularly because Scotland has such strengths in that area, so in terms of world firsts and world leading initiatives around climate change and sustainability. France Scotland does um, feed into that and does have a narrative to build around it. We are working really closely with the government, who obviously have their kind of uh, policy driven objectives as well. So working with them to establish where what they're doing and how we build upon it. Um, but you will have seen that kind of climate and green has been at the core of an awful lot of our narrative for, for several years, because as I said, we have such incredible stories to tell. Um, so we'll be building upon that further now to say what opportunity COP offers us and then beyond that as well, because that's just kind of an, a, a climax to all those things coming together but actually there's there's so much more to be done and um, so showing what action we're taking off the back of it yeah it's a great great platform so what would you say would be the biggest consumer change you've seen in in your business and how have you reacted to that you've probably seen some of the comments that have come from your campaign but have have people changed their behaviors or their intentions and how they're they're doing things yeah i mean the pandemic has um <laughs> change things at a seismic level so we've gone on the kind of visitor side you know we've gone from record levels of international tourism and a vibrant and growing industry to an industry in complete crisis on a global scale um so travel restrictions the prevalence and risk of infection confidence around travel um, and the actual uh, limitations to that have had a notable impact um, Similarly, that then impacts other areas like the migration of talent, the investment opportunities, how willing people are to set up new businesses in Scotland at a time when movement is so limited. So we've seen huge changes in terms of our, our audiences and, and how we've had to react to as, as a result of that. Okay. Um, so the, the campaign's obviously been very successful. How are you capitalising on what's been achieved with this campaign to move forward, say, the next 12 to 12 months to three years, say. Yeah. Right. So that, do you mean, sorry, the campaign as in the one, the one part I discussed or the whole of Scotland is now? Uh, Scotland is now, say. Yeah. Um, so we, I suppose the whole, the whole point of it is to continue to build upon the success. So it's about reinforcing that, that narrative and the value proposition. So each individual piece of kind of tactical campaign activity like Scotland is open or um, our diversity campaign or our climate mm -hmm. Um, campaigns, they're all part of the story that show the kind of nuances and layers of character that Scotland have. And, and as I said, those world first, world leading, exciting um, stories that we have to tell the world. Scotland is now how we build upon that trajectory is by continuing to focus on our long term ambition and objective and make sure that all the tactical things and performance based activity we deliver feeds into that. So that we're building upon those strengths and continuing to strengthen that identity. Okay. Um, next question: um, is Scotland, the brand involved in any campaigns to try and attract young professionals, um, and the, the examples they've given as social workers, teachers, etc. Because you've mentioned about attracting tourism and business investment, is there that sort of level of targeting? Yeah. There is. There is. So again. The, I think when I showed the at a glance, it was very quickly at a glance what we've done in the last two and a half years. There was a few in there. So there was GPU recruitment, uh, teacher recruitment, for example, two of the big gaps that we have, which are 
um, largely um, filled by the migration of talent into Scotland. So they're not largely filled, but they're, they are filled by lots of migration of talent into Scotland. So how we work with that is there's the, the moments in time activity that we do, as I said, that's your Brexit, your COP, etc. And then there's the policy driven or economic driven actions, which would be things like we have a dearth of 500 uh, thousand or 500 teaching um, roles. How do we fill those? And then that's when we respond with very specific uh, talent attraction campaigns or student attraction campaigns, for example. Okay. And then we've got a question. Um, what social listening platform did you use? Practical question. We've used a variety. Currently, we use Brandwatch and Falcon um, in terms of analysis and listening. Okay. Um, and the question um, we've got from um, talking about lockdowns. Um, previous lockdown, we've just heard it on the news in, in England recently. Everybody going mad now looking at holiday destinations. Um, did you see any changes in from um, potential destinations once restrictions are lifted? Um, and did you have to alter your messaging to reflect that? So pot potential staycations or perhaps instead of targeting mainland Europe, maybe the rest of the UK? Has that yeah. been a factor? Yeah, it has, absolutely. I think so with my kind of Visit Scotland rather than the, the brand Scotland hat on, we've had to be very agile and adapt our messaging um, so that we've kind of responded to that total shift in audience demographic and behaviour where naturally we've seen this rapid decline in international presentation. Um, so we've had to move our messaging to more kind of dream now, travel later. We've had to but then also be reactive to when restrictions change and um, things allow for us to move to more of a conversion based messaging. Um, what's been really interesting, I suppose, for us is that it's resulted in a massive spike, or it did result when it, when it allowed a massive spike in domestic tourism, um, which shifted our focus to things like staycations. Um, and we saw a big increase in self-drive, self-catering, rural and coastal holidays. Um, but that had an impact on the likes of cities um, and their offerings. So there's this, this flip side in terms of what we have to then be able to position and strengthen as we move forward, as things open back up again. Um, and it's not just tourism that that impacts. Obviously, there's across other economic pillars, it, it impacts everything about what students are coming here. Um, about what investors are coming here, etc. So it's absolutely shifted our messaging and our approach. Okay. And then um, looking at learning, um, the question is, have, has there been any learning from previous Scotland the Brand partnership initiatives, such as the one that was run in the late 90s? And how have you applied that learning to this most recent campaigns? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, it was really, really important that when I came in and when we started doing this, we didn't kind of throw the baby out of the bathwater and start again, assuming that um, nothing had been done before. So there's a, there's a lot of great learnings from previous work that had been done. They were all very different models, um, so not directly comparable, but it doesn't mean there wasn't things to learn. So um, Scotland the Brand from the 90s, what we learned around that was the focus was an awful lot around the mark itself, so this mark of provenance. Um, and it was direct, it was developed by one of the, the our economic agency, um, but not really in partnership with industry or with other national organizations. And eventually it was kind of privatized and licensed. Um, and that was never really gonna work when there wasn't that level of buy-in across. You know, we hadn't consulted with industry, we hadn't consulted with other partners and brought them along on that journey. So we learned a lot from what worked and what didn't there. Um, and similarly with other initiatives that have focused on either collaborative efforts or branding of a nation, both within Scotland and elsewhere. Okay, and I think we've got time for probably one last question. Uh, let me have a look. Um, Brexit. Um, someone's asking, you know, was the, was the key to this campaign the Brexit result? Um, but how, how do we move forward from that? How is things evolving as Brexit's panning out and, and will the campaign be evolving in future? What will come next? I don't think the key was the result. I think that's what made it quite a brave move from the partners actually to, to allow us to do what we did because we, we, we developed the campaign and the idea based on the fact that it didn't really matter what the outcome was. That was outside of control. 
what mattered was that we wanted our European natives and, and neighbours to know how we felt and they, that we still valued their relationship and wanted to continue working with them. So I don't think the result changed anything particularly. And certainly in terms of the responses we saw from the audiences, it was it was that emotional connection um, that really, really resonated um, and that resonated, that, that made people want to listen to it and be part of it and respond. Moving it forward, we've done quite a lot. So as I said, we reran the campaign on the next Brexit date, but then we also, um, when we now officially left the EU, ran a, a kind of the next episode, I suppose, of that campaign. So obviously Scotland is open. It's not quite the right message for this moment in time. Um, but the sentiment of what we meant by that in terms of open and welcoming and, and the warmth of the people and the, the willingness to continue to collaborate and work with nations around the world and welcome people in. Uh, that remains. So the next uh, part of that campaign was the development of our Scotland is Here uh, creative, which ran um, from the 1st of January this year, um, mm -hmm. uh, five days. Um, and again, we saw similar levels of engagement and positive sentiment and response. And that was about saying, now we have left, that doesn't change our relationship and we still are committed to working with Europe. So I think in terms of the, that very specific part of the narrative, that doesn't change and it's not just Europe we, we want to work with. You know, we recognise that most nations, when they talk about nation branding, they talk about the biggest and best and um, things and things that they're the best at. We do do that, but we also want to talk about the fact that we can't do things on our own. So, you know, we can't solve climate change alone. That's a global effort. So it's very much about recognising how we continue to work with other nations to deliver results against those global challenges. Okay. Thank you. And I think with that, we'll uh, draw the question section to a close. That's been excellent. Thank you very much, Kat. Um, and there's some very good questions uh, and answers there. So that's all the time we have now for the Q&A session today. We'd just like to say thank you so much to Kat for today's presentation, to CIM Scotland for organising the event, and a thank you to you all for watching. We do hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. Our next webinar express is Performing Under Pressure, From Thinking Clearly to Brilliant Marketing. And that is on Tuesday, the 9th of March at one o'clock, hosted by CIM Greater London. You'll find it listed on the events page on the CIM website, where you'll be able to find out more information and to register for the session. Once again, you'll shortly be receiving a survey on today's webinar, and we'd really appreciate it if you could provide your feedback. So on behalf of CIM, thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.